she asked to speak to me confidentially in a very serious tone of voice, told me that Charlie had investigated all possible options to take care of the problem of Danny Markell, including hiring a hitman, which would cost about $15,000. And I later revised that and thought maybe it was $50,000, but the dollar amount was the only thing in question. She definitely said that Charles Idelson had looked into hiring a hitman to kill Danny Markell. That was Wendy Adelson's ex-boyfriend, Jeffrey Lacaz. If she's put into trial, he's going to be a big witness. And he was testifying there during Charlie Adelson's trial as investigators in the Dan Markell murder case searched for clues in the early stages of the case. They interviewed Lacaz, who told them they needed to look into Charlie Adelson. Lacaz implicated not only Charlie Adelson, but insinuated that Wendy knew about that sinister plan. Wendy Adelson has not been charged with any crimes at this point. She did receive limited immunity to testify. Wendy denies Lacasse's claim that she knew about the hitman and what was going to happen to her then husband, Dan. Did you say that Charlie, your brother, this defendant, had explored all options to resolve the problem, including hiring a hitman, and it would cost either fifteen or $50,000? No. And did you have a conversation with Jeffrey Lacoste at your residence that night where you said you wanted to share something in confidence with him? No. Did you ever say that your brother had seriously hired a hitman where it, you weren't repeating the joke? You no. were serious. All right, still with me, Carl Steinbeck, Dr. Jenny Lacey, and Jason Jensen. J Jason, I want to start with you because I'm sure you watched some of her testimony. Um, and, and it came out that when police first interviewed her, they asked her if she would know anyone who would do this. Naturally, they went to her. She was the one having issues with Dan Markell. And she immediately began spilling the beans on what a difficult situation it was, how mad her parents were at it, uh, the things that Charlie had said things that she just volunteered to police. What do you think that was about? I, I couldn't make up my mind if that was someone speaking who was guilty, trying to cover it up, or um, someone who just didn't really know what was going on and was afraid that something awful had happened. Right, I mean, I, I heard that part of her testimony and it sounded at the time, you know, if you put that testimony in a box and just in a vacuum, it sounds sincere that, you know, when asked by investigators who could have done this, and she insinuated, would look at my brother, Charlie. So that goes to her defense if there is charges filed against her. But then when you look at all the other things, that this is your family, they did it at, at your behest, if not at your request, that's where we're going to start getting into the the nuance of, you know, back and forth between the prosecution and the defense, whether she had actual knowledge of a of an actual plan in effect, or as her ex-boyfriend indicates, that it was explored. Doesn't mean that it was uh, executed with her knowledge, but that Charlie had discussed with her that it was explored. Yeah, and you know, when, when you look at her testimony, this idea that, you know, she didn't know she was the beneficiary of all this. She was the one involved in a difficult situation. And, and Dr. Lacey, uh, I got to ask you, you watched her on the stand. She didn't strike me as someone that would be rattled under pressure. I thought she handled herself extremely well on the stand. Um, she didn't strike me as someone who would go into an interrogation room or would be, you know, interviewed by police and be so nervous that she just sort of spilling the beans. So in my, my heart of hearts, I believe that maybe it was calculated. What sense did you get of her on the stand? I would probably say that when she went to the stand, obviously she was well prepared and she knew probably with the help of those that are around her of what was going to be asked. But when I look back at the video of her being interrogated, I would imagine that some of that truly was probably authentically her, but then there's some part of it that probably she did know that because her boyfriend or ex-boyfriend, you know, in those romantic relationships, you're very comfortable, you speak the truth, you are, you're in this un, an intimate relationship. So I would imagine with the very least agreeing with Jason that she probably at least 
had some exploratory conversations or knew what was being discussed, the execution of it, perhaps they protected her from that. Uh, but I would imagine that she did go in there knowing had some level of knowledge in that interrogation room. So, you know, probably some of it was a little bit rehearsed and some of it could have been authentically um, her truth and it could have been set up that way so that she didn't know a lot of the details um, so that she was sheltered from what was really happening. Yeah, would be my guess. All of those things could definitely be true. Now, Wendy Adelson's alibi was actually corroborated. She was home, as I mentioned earlier, having her TV repaired when her ex-husband was gunned down in his driveway. Now, you know that appointment was made by Donna. Now, later that afternoon, Wendy left her house and drove past her ex-husband's house where emergency responders were at the scene. Now, was she just passing by or did she know that this was the scene of a crime and had to get there just to see it, like a pyromaniac having to see a fire? Take a listen. Did you go to the crime scene or very near the crime scene on your way from your residence to, I guess, to lunch or to wherever you were going next? No, I did not. So you never turned on Trescott Drive that day? I went to turn on Trescott Drive, but I saw that it had been blocked off by some tape, and so I just kept driving on Centerville. Okay, and when you, you had to turn around at the tape, right, to go back I out? I think I tried to turn right, and it couldn't turn, so I would have made like a the kind of turn, like a K turn, and kept going. Was there a roadblock there with? There was tape. Yeah, and an officer was there? I didn't a... see an officer, but I did see a car. But for a Tallahassee police officer that was on the scene of Dan Markell's murder, he testified during Charlie Adelson's trial that he did see a car matching Wendy's approach to the crime scene on that day. From the roadblock where you were positioned, could you see the crime scene? Yes. Would it have been obvious to someone approaching your position in a vehicle that there was activity, law enforcement activity going on at that residence? It seems, it seems likely. Did you know at the time that Wendy Adelson drove this type of vehicle? Yes. All right, so you noticed this vehicle or a vehicle identical to this one approach your position? Yes, ma'am. What did the vehicle do when it approached your position? Uh, just stopped pretty quick and turned around and headed back in the other direction. Now, Carl Steinbeck, you know, conspiracy charges don't require that much, just a, a couple of act in furtherance of the conspiracy, an agreement between the group. The one thing they don't have, though, with Wendy is a lot of her on tape. A lot of these using the code and doing the different things that they've got against Donna and Charlie, they don't have her doing that. Your thoughts on whether she might be next. I will say one thing. In the probable cause affidavit for the arrest of Charlie, she's mentioned as a co-conspirator. In the one for Donna, she is not. I'll just say that, but your thoughts. Yeah, no, I think there's a lot of indications of what she was doing before, during, and after the murder of Dan Markell to indicate she was not only just aware of it, but she was actively involved in it. In fact, the prosecutor in the closing argument of Charlie Adelson's trial argued that Jeff Lacoste, her ex-boyfriend uh, that she dumped a few days before the murder, actually was framed to be the fall guy. He was supposed to take the, the fall and have the police go after him, but uh, he left town a day earlier, so her plan backfired, and he also had uh, videotape to show he was up in Tennessee. So she took an active role in a number of ways. She also didn't talk to Dan the week he was murdered. He was trying to talk to her about this, the new school she had set up to, with the boys unbeknownst to him. And so Dan was actually talking to somebody at the school to try, try to find out more about the school at the time he got uh, the two shots to, to his head. So there is, there is a lot of evidence there. Uh, and I, I would submit to you there's well over 100 indicators of her involvement. I've put those out there on our YouTube channel, Jury Trial Mentor. And you can come to your own conclusions as to whether she was involved or not. But I think there's a strong enough case that there, there could easily be a, a proof beyond a reasonable doubt if you have the right prosecutor trying it. Yeah, and it's important to note that the limited immunity that she got was only to anything she testified to. All the evidence you're talking about and anything that was garnered other than through her testimony is still useful against her in a prosecution. I suspect they may need her for Donna's prosecution, and then they may go after her. All right. Thanks to Jason Jensen for being with us tonight. Jason, always a real pleasure to have you on the show.